choice. The, the breath should be the thing that we are most familiar with in our lives. And yet when you start out meditating, it seems alien. Why stay just with the breath? What does it have to offer? This is a thought that will occur to you not only at the beginning of your meditative career, but many times throughout it. There come a point you say, this is really stupid. I'm not using any intelligence. It's just staying here with this very basic physical phenomenon. But because it is so basic, that's why it's so important. And because we need skill in learning how to stay with something a long period of time. That's why there's very little emphasis placed on being clever in the meditation. I mean, you use your ingenuity to get the mind to settle down. Once it's settled down, you use your ingenuity in getting it to stay there. And once you've got it to stay there, then you just have to learn to stick with it. Make that your basic habit. Make it so that it is the most familiar part of your life, what's happening to the breath. what's happening in the present moment, so that ultimately you can see deeper into what's going on in your mind. Without this skill, all the understanding you might have about the mind, your psychology, the Buddha's teachings, is all just concepts. And you can reason about it, and you can argue about it. But it doesn't really accomplish what the, the purpose of the Buddhist teachings to begin with, which is to get the mind beyond suffering. And in the course of getting release from suffering, you gain release from a lot of problems. A lot of other issues get settled as well. So we're working on a skill. And as you approach this, you have to have the same attitude that you would have towards any skill. On the one hand, you have to give a lot of time to it. to develop the sort of patience that comes with <coughs> learning a skill. And for a lot of us, that kind of patience is something that we have, we've never really learned. So many things are done automatically, instantly for us. There's so many machines that take over the things that used to require skill. Simple thing like sharpening a knife. All you have to do is run the blade through a knife, sharpen it down, zip, zip, and it's sharp. Back in the past, you needed a whetstone. And it took time, and you had to be very patient and very steady in what you were doing. Because if you got impatient and wanted to get things, get the knife really sharp, really fast, you ended up spoiling the blade. So you have to be patient and very steady in your attentiveness. If you stop being attentive, okay, something was going to happen to the blade. Same with making a pot, all kinds of skills people used to have to, to master just in order to function on a daily basis, in order to live comfortably. Nowadays, for most of us, we've lost those skills. But the meditation is still one thing that you can't have a machine do for you. There's no instant meditation pill or instant meditation machine. And so if you don't already, haven't already developed the patience and other skills, well, you've got to learn how to develop it right here, right now. And that means putting up with the impulse to go off and do something else. Because when you're learning a skill, that means there are other things you're, you have to put aside, other things you have to give up. You want to really give your time to this. And the question with each skill is exactly how much time is it worth? For example, playing chess. Okay. I remember reading a book that was written back in the Renaissance talking about the, the skills that a gentleman should master. And it made an interesting point. It says you should learn enough chess to be good at it, but not so much that you're an expert, because it's really not worth it. The amount of time that's required to become a chess master just doesn't really pay off. So devote a little time to that so you can you know, make a respectable showing. But there are more important things in life. 
But when, when it comes to the meditation, it's hard to think of anything that would be more important than mastering the skill to overcome suffering. So this is the kind of skill that the more time you can put into it, the better. The more you master it, the better. There's no one point where you can say that you're too good at meditation. So it's one of those things you can give yourself to wholeheartedly. Because you look at the path and total release from suffering. Not only the Buddha, but many noble disciples, men, women, children, from ever since the time of the Buddha, who really have given themselves to the practice, all come out and say, yes, it's more than worth it. And so you owe it to yourself to put it to the test. And all the time devoted to the practice is time well spent. As to whatever extent you're able to lessen your suffering, okay, that's time well spent. The mastery you get over the mind in terms of being more mindful, being more alert. Whether you can give your whole life to the meditation or have other responsibilities, all the time you spend on it is what time well spent, whether you get to the end of the path or not. So keep these points in mind, especially in the beginning stages where sometimes it seems that like you're stumbling and picking yourself up and stumbling and pick yourself up again. Sometimes they're good sessions immediately followed by sessions where the mind's all over the place. There doesn't seem to be nice, steady progress. Keep reminding yourself, well, that's the way skills are. If this were a very simple skill, the kind of thing that would make steady progress, it wouldn't have such a deep impact on the mind. The mind is a very complex phenomenon, so it's its progress, its growing mastery is going to be a complex process as well. John Lee makes a comparison with a banana tree as opposed to a tree with lots of branches. The banana tree has only one stem. It grows very quickly, gives fruit, and then it dies. But trees with lots of branches, like big oaks, teak trees, they take a long time to grow. But once they have grown, okay, then there's a lot of there's a lot of heartwood to them. A banana tree has no heartwood at all. You just peel away the layers and there's nothing. But the trees that take a long time, those are the ones that have a lot of heartwood and they're really valuable. And it's the same with the skill of meditation. Okay, okay sometimes it takes a lot of time and patience. But the results that you get are more than worth it. So an important part of this skill is your ability to sort of pick yourself up when you stumble, dust yourself off, give yourself some encouragement, and then keep on going. Once you can develop that attitude, okay, then the meditation will have to make progress. If you let yourself get discouraged by minor setbacks, Okay, I can guarantee there are going to be minor setbacks all along the way, so you're setting yourself up for a fall. So if you realize it's, it's a normal part of developing a complex skill. You'll have great sessions, and immediately after that, because you get kind of on a roll and your expectations get high and your mindfulness gets sloppy, okay, the next session is almost guaranteed not to be any, is guaranteed to be a mess. So when things go well, don't let yourself get carried away. Just try to note after you've come out of a good session, okay, what did I do just now? Why did that work? When you come out of a bad session or in your middle of a bad session, okay, why is it not working? What can be changed? In other words, try to maintain as much equanimity throughout the whole process when it's going well, when it's going poorly. So you can observe, see cause and effect. And get a sense of exactly, okay, what does work, what doesn't work. And each time you meditate, okay, if it's not going well again, okay, put what you've learned to the test to further refine your powers of observation. When you do that, every session of meditation okay, is a good session in the sense that you've been observant, you've watched. Even when things don't go well throughout the whole session, well, you've learned okay, what bad meditation is like. Then you've learned, okay, to stick with it in spite of it, to 
the fact that it's not going well. And that stick with activeness, that's an important skill. It's an important quality that's needed in the meditation. So when it goes well, you keep on sitting. When it goes doesn't seem to go well, you just keep on sitting. And do your best to keep your powers of observation alert and alive. So you can catch the little things that make the difference. And often it's just that, it's the details. That extra little bit of being sensitive to the breath, that extra little bit of okay, trying to lengthen out the amount of time you're, you're mindful. Because you'll find your mindfulness tends to go in, in phrases. If we're making a comparison with music, it has a phrase and then the phrase stops. And then there's a new phrase and that phrase stops. Yeah, you find that in the beginning of the mindfulness tends to go for a little while, then it stops for a second, and then you pick it up again and go for another one. We try to lengthen each of those phrases. So it's not just one breath, it's several breaths. Or it's not just several breaths, it's more than that. And to finally get to the point where it just sticks and it just stays there continually from one breath to the next, to the next, to the next. And it's usually just minor, minor things, the texture of the breath. The pressure of your awareness, the amount of push you give, not too much, not too little. All this comes as part of the skill of learning what's not, what is too much, what is too little. And that can be learned only through trial and error. If things seem not to be going well, you remind yourself, well, at least you're on the right path. You're doing something that's a major operation on the mind. And if you don't do it now, okay, when are you going to do it? And if you don't, who's going to do it for you? It's something you've got to do for yourself. Because the skills you develop in meditation, you find that when things do get tough in life, those are the things you have to fall back on. Your mindfulness, your alertness, your discernment. When illness comes, when accidents come, when loss and suffering come, when death comes, these are the only things you'll be able to depend on to see yourself through. And so times like that, you'll be really grateful to yourself that you did put in this time now. And you didn't waste it furthering away or following other diversions. Okay, there's serious work that needs to be done in the mind. You're doing it. You're doing your best at it. Okay, what more can you want? Your life has a direction. It has a goal. It's interesting how much we think that you know, Buddhism is goalless and you know, the path is the goal, or the, that kind of teaching, but it's not the way it is. There's a definite goal. There's nirvana. And as the Buddha said, it's the highest happiness. I was reading recently a letter about from someone who was teaching in India. And because he was teaching in a college, the Indians were trying to make this college as Western as possible. So they stuck all sorts of encouraging Western-style encouragements up on the board, up on posters on the wall. And one of the ones that they were offering was, happiness is having a goal. And Western psychologists are teaching us, well, if you have too much of a goal, too many goals, then you make yourself miserable. Okay, who's right? Do you think of so many people out there living directionless lives? Can that be called happiness? Can that kind of life be fulfilling? It's a question each of us has to ask him or herself.